Okay, Mr. Marshall, you have a quorum. It is 6.34, the attendees have arrived. I think you're good to go. All right, I think my clock is different than yours. So we'll, I will list another time. Okay. All right, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 21st, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.36 PM. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colden. Here. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Uh, Doug Marshall. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Uh, Janet McGowan. Present. Uh, Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Present. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, uh, so the first item on tonight's agenda as usual is minutes from uh, some previous meeting. And tonight we have the minutes from our last meeting on September 7th. Uh, Board members, uh, is there, are there any uh, comments about the minutes as drafted? Not seeing any, so, uh, oh yeah, Johanna. No, I was just gonna say that I read through them and they look good to me and I would move to approve the minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a second to that motion? Tom Long. Is I second that, and thank you, Pam, for turning those around so fast. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Tom, and yes, thank you, Pam. All right, uh, are there, if there are no further comments, we'll go ahead and vote. 
All right, um, starting with Bruce. I'll abstain since I haven't seen them. Okay. I do hope we get, uh, get you conversant with how to download those every, every meeting. Tom? Aye. And Drew? Aye. Yep, uh, Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Karen Winter? Aye. Thank you. And I'm an I as well. So the vote is six in favor, one abstention. All right, so the time now is 641 and we'll go to the public comment period. Maybe I'll start that by reading the names of the participants that I can see in the attendees list. And the three uh, public attendees at the moment are Bruce Allen, uh, Limin C, L-I-M-I-N, with a, just a C as the second name, and uh, Mara Keen. Okay, so to all of our attendees, uh, would any of you like to make a public comment at this time on something that is not on tonight's agenda? Okay, I do not see any hands raised. So I will conclude that we do not have any public comment this evening. All right, um, so the time now is 6.42 and uh, we can go on to the third item on our agenda. <clears throat> um, we're gonna have two public hearings this evening. The first one, uh, okay, so the first one is as follows. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2023-01 and SPP 2023-01, Archipelago Investments, LLC, 47 Olympia Drive. This is a joint public hearing to request site plan review under section 3.326 of the zoning bylaw uh, to construct a private apartment style dormitory with 68 dwelling units and associated interior and exterior spaces and associated site improvements, including waiver of on-site parking requirements and a special permit to modify maximum building coverage and height requirements under section six, table three, footnote A of the zoning bylaw uh, with the uh, property uh, located on map 88D, rather, parcel 18 in the RF zoning district. And this hearing is continued from August 3rd of, of this year. So uh, I guess I can ask if there are any board member disclosures. I don't remember any from the earlier uh, hearing. I do not see any. Okay, Chris, uh, I think you probably need to give us some introduction for this evening's hearing. Yes, um, I've been in touch with um, the applicant uh, Kyle Wilson, mm -hmm. and um, he has requested a continuance of this public hearing to um, the next date that the planning board is meeting, which would be October 19th. And the reason for his request is that he has been um, before the Conservation Commission. Um, the Conservation Commission opened a public hearing on his project on the 14th of September but they weren't able to um, take testimony or really discuss the project at that time because they had a full agenda. So they've continued their public hearing to September 28th. And um, <clears throat> so Kyle doesn't have any um, input from the Conservation Commission. And I believe that the Planning Board would like to have um, certainly some recommendations from the Conservation Commission before you move forward with your approval. Um, the other thing is that we still don't have a um, comment letter, a letter of comment from the town engineer. 
And I believe that Kyle is also putting together some um, other changes to his proposal, one of which has to do with the management plan. Um, he took seriously the discussion that you had the other night about um, the need for a 24 hour, seven day a week live in manager. So I think he's going to be proposing that as an addition to his management plan. Um, but in any event, he did submit an email um, requesting that you continue his public hearing to October 19th. And uh, he is not here tonight. Um, <clears throat> so I, I feel like you shouldn't really discuss the project in his absence. And I recommend that you go ahead and continue the public hearing to October 19th. Okay. Um, and if we were to do that, is there a time on October 19th that you would recommend? Um, I'm going to ask for Pam's input on that. I think we have 51 Spalding Street at 635. Correct. And then I think we were imagining that we would have um, another public hearing, which is coming up next here tonight. Um, we we're imagining that one would be continued and also be said. continued, but we can yeah. set a time for that um, later on mm -hmm. tonight. So uh, we could say, that this public hearing would be scheduled for 645 on the 19th archipelago. Does that make sense, Pam? Um, it does. It puts it after the one that we've already continued, which is Spalding Street, but before um, anything new that might arise tonight. So, mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. I'm not sure. Um, so I went, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to talk about this right now, but um, I saw that Chris Brestrup had sent a list of um, things that we're looking for, the planning board is looking for more information on. And I was concerned, I, I think we need more information on parking in the sense where Mr. Wilson said that he had sort of deeded rights to parking on the UMass subdivision lots. And then we have correspondence from UMass showing that they don't seem, they don't even, there's not even enough parking in their lots. And I just think we needed more information on that, like an agreement or something, you know, some more detail on does Archipelago or Mr. Wilson have rights to park on UMass land or are there spaces? That, that issue I think was, um, so I don't, I hope I'm not making opinions on it, but I just think we need more information on that. May I speak? Yes. So I did um, try to drive that point home to Mr. Wilson. Um, I sent him a copy of the minutes of the uh, August 3rd um, planning board meeting where that was discussed to some extent. And I listed it in the, um, email that I sent to him, which I copied, I gave you a copy in your packets. So I think he realizes that this is a you know, serious issue that he needs to come forth with information about. And that was also one of the things that he wanted to um, try to resolve before he meets with you next time. I, I didn't mention it, I'm sorry, but I forgot to mention that one. That's okay. Uh, Karen, I see your hand. You're muted, Karen. Karen, you're muted. So I, I hope this is the right time to mention that I, uh, Chris, maybe you could convey something that we're, that I am particularly concerned that he provides some sort of accommodation for bicycles. Um, and maybe the you know, it would be great if he and the university would somehow, since parking and you're trying to get as few cars there necessary, uh, the students should use alternate means. He could somehow contact the university about um, a dedicated bicycle path directly from these houses. Uh, is this inappropriate to bring in? But since he's reconfigurating, I think he should know that I, I particularly am concerned about that. Okay. All right, so Chris. So that is one of the topics that I um, also reminded Mr. Wilson of. I've had 
phone conversations with him and I've told him that he needs to provide bicycle um, accommodations. Uh, I can pass along the idea about a dedicated bicycle path. Um, I must say though that I think you probably should hold off on, on further suggestions or discussion about this until you meet with him. And, um, you know, if you wanted to send me some email individually about things that you want to see when he meets back with us on the 19th, that would be appropriate. And then I can just um, forward those emails to him. Okay. Yeah, I know I saw one email from one board member to you about something he was thinking about. Okay. Um, so in that case, I guess... Uh, we can go ahead and have a motion to continue the hearing to October 19th at 6.45 p.m. Tom. So moved. Thank you, Tom. Andrew. So seconded. Thank you, Andrew. All right, is there any further conversation from the board? Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and have a vote to continue. Bruce. Uh, approve. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So seven votes in favor of continuing. Okay, so at this time we'll move on to the second of our public hearings this evening. Um, hey, uh, Chris, uh, I see that that was advertised at 735. Can we proceed with this now or do we need to do some other business and come back to it? I suggest that you take up the um, <clears throat> Article 14 item and then you can either interrupt Article 14 at 7.35 and have a conversation about flood mapping, or you can just put it off till um, towards the end of the meeting. Um, we have a lot to discuss about Article 14. Okay. Um, so that might be a good thing to take up and then put off flood mapping till later. Okay, so in that case, it is 6.53 and we will skip uh, item the second of our public hearings and go to item five on the agenda the zoning amendment regarding article 14 temporary zoning temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath this is a proposal to make permanent certain aspects of zoning bylaw article 14 temporary zoning Chris would you like to introduce this I would like to introduce Nate Malloy, and he will give you a presentation about um, the proposal for uh, extending and making permanent Article 14. We're not calling it Article 14 anymore. The proposal is called something else, but Nate can explain that. Okay. Welcome, Nate. <clears throat> sure. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Uh, there's five documents I'm going to share. One's a presentation, and then the, you know the the zoning language itself. Um, Maureen Pollock, uh, planner with the town presented this back in June and then we've, you know, we've modified it. Um, the request was to actually have some, you know, some uh, language or things in, you know, in a zoning format to review. So the, um, I'm going to share my screen and then, you know, after all the presentation, I guess we could stop after that and then move on to the technical documents, I guess. So if that's visible for everyone. Um, Right, so it's really, you know, it's Article 14 is the temporary zoning. We're, we're really just looking at food and drink establishments with that. So we're not looking at the rest of Article 14. It's just that one, one piece. And so these background points were presented earlier. We can just repeat them that, you know, Article 14 has expedited permitting and review for almost 40, 40 applications. Um, it's been successful. There's really been no complaints. Um, but Article 14 does expire at the end of this year. And so it, it will unlikely to be extended. Um, the town's looking at other aspects that were approved in Article 14 and trying to come up with other zoning measures. Um, 
and you know the CRC town staff and and the Amherst business you know business community has asked for this. You know, are there ways to help uh, keep some of those provisions of Article 14 in zoning? And the goal, really, you know, there's a number of, of purposes and goals. Um, you know, some of it is to allow for streamlined permitting to get to the board permits that really might have impacts and need to be reviewed, whether it's through site plan review or through special permits. So, you know, what we found is that uh, a number of food and drink establishments can be approved administratively uh, and they don't have any problems, but it's really there are certain maybe uses or certain ones that may have some impacts that still need a land use permit. And so, we're really proposing to get to the board ones that, you know, planning board or zoning board that really need this, need that kind of review. Um, you know, and, and really it's an effort to have businesses relocate to Amherst, stay in Amherst, and then also help support the, the bid and chamber. And so what's been permitted through Article 14? Like I said, there's been about 40 approvals um, and 18 of those have our, you know, deal with restaurants or outdoor dining. And so some are, you know, like the spoke literally expanded into this other half of the building through Article 14. Um, the Drake opened under Article 14. Uh, and then, you know, Garcia is also both indoor and then outdoor dining through Article 14. And so, you know, that was done administratively. There is a decision written by the building commissioner kept on file in, uh, in town hall with the town clerk and at the planning department. Um, and there hasn't really been um, any issues with that. So, you know, plans are required, a management plan is required, uh, and really we're asking applicants to submit um, enough information that staff can make a decision. And, and where this happens is really in, you know, the area shown in red. So it's, you know, uh, only a few zoning districts. It's in the BG and BL in the downtown, uh, BVC, uh, uh, Business Village Center, Neighborhood Business, and then the commercial. And so, you know, the proposals we're, we're recommending to the food and drink establishments only impact these zoning districts. They're not allowed in any other zoning district. So the whole, all the white in town you see here is not changing. So, right, it's not gonna affect outlying residential areas or anything else. It's really just, you know, in the, in the village center cores. And what we're proposing to do with the food and drink establishments is, um, eliminate what's there now in terms of class one, class two, and class three, and come up with what's shown um, in green, you know, four different use categories. And um, the reason being, it wasn't necessarily for clarification, it's to um, have categories that make more sense in terms of the uses we're seeing. So, um, you know, right, right now, class one and class two, is essentially the same thing unless one's open late or serves alcohol. Um, but in the end, they're treated almost the same in terms of permitting. Um, they're almost always approved as a special permit with a standard set of conditions. Um, in class three drive up restaurant, that's, that does, isn't used very much because we allow drive through as an accessory use. So what we're proposing is to have a restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar food or beverage establishment by site plan review. And so it's, you know, it's essentially combining class one and class two. Um, there's a bar with no food. So, um, you know, there's a few that, you know, they could serve pro possibly prepackaged food according to, um, you know, state regulation, but they wouldn't have a kitchen or, a, you know, or anything like that. Then there's a nightclub, which there are a few of in Amherst. Uh, and then a, an establishment with more than 250 um, occupancy limit or capacity. So, that's not chairs, it's, you know, what's the actual capacity uh, of the space. And those three uses would be by special permit. And so just some examples of what we're talking about um, that would be by site plan review. So Johnny's Tavern, Savannah's, Bruno's and House of Teriyaki. Um, a bar with no food is the Moan and Dove. Um, a nightclub, so Hazel's uh, in downtown is considered a nightclub. So. Um, there's a building code definition of nightclub, and that's how, you know, that really determines um, if it falls in that category. So, you know, it's, it's high density, limited seating. It actually says loud music, um, but there's a few parameters in the building code that would, would trigger an application to be considered a nightclub. You know, even if someone was saying it's a bar, but they present a plan, um, the building commissioner would 
have to categorize it as a nightclub. And then establishments with over 250 occupancy. And so, um, you know, there, there are uh, establishments in town that act as a restaurant or, or, you know, a bar with food during the day. And then at a certain time, they might transition to a bar with no food. And right now we're saying that the restaurant part would, would be by site plan or view, but if they wanted to be open later and turn it into a bar, they would need a special permit. And so they would actually have to go through two permitting paths. And that's something for the board to consider. So, um, you know, there's other ways to, to manage that, that process. Um, it does happen now uh, in some respects, you know, a, a project may come in for site plan review for mixed use building. And then the use itself that comes in in a, in a particular space may be by special permit. So it, it's similar to that. Um, and so we're still proposing that, that those uses, you know, a bar with no food, nightclub and a larger establishment, you know, could be impactful and, and then would go through the special permit process. Um, and associated with that, it, it was then the actual changes to the zoning bylaw. So article three, the use table would change with that whole, you know, chart of proposed uses. Um, article five, so accessory uses. Article 11, uh, there's a, few, a little change in article 11. And then article 12, updating um, two definitions. And that's it for the presentation. Um, if there's any questions or Doug, if you want me to go into showing the zoning, you know, the actual zoning piece. All right, I see Janice got her hand up. Maybe sure. you have a question. So I, I think I was, I've, always, I've been, I'm sort of confused about the framing around article 14 and these changes mm -hmm. um, because article 14 let the building commissioner make a whole series of decisions that would normally go to the ZBA and the planning board. And so in these changes that you're suggesting, I don't see a change in who's deciding, just a change in whether it goes to site plan review or special permit. So it's either gonna to come to the planning board or it's gonna to come to the ZBA. And so, because article um, 11 site plan review already allows the building commissioner to, there's a whole path in that that right. says, you know, if you're not making any changes to the exterior of the building, you don't need site plan review. If there's, you know, a change to the use, but it's really minor, you don't need site plan review. And so I don't really understand why we're talking about Article 14, because what we're really talking about is in our normal process of either sending something to a special permit or to site plan review, the planning department is suggesting changes in that. And so, and that has repercussions in terms of who makes the decision, whether the special permit is discretionary, um, you know, appeal times. But so I'm kind of a lost a little bit on the framing of this as Article 14. So, so maybe to help me understand this a little better, if we go back and look at this, the Spoke, Garcias, and the Drake, if we weren't in COVID times and we didn't have Article 14, would, would those restaurants and that um, venue, music venue, have come to a board? And what board would it have come to? <clears throat> yeah, now, no, that's a really good question. So in Article 14, there are provisions for, you know, outdoor dining and certain things that the building commissioner could approve administratively. And so typically that would have to have gone, you know, so if someone was proposing, you know, an, a space for outdoor dining, that would have to go through, a, a you know, a site plan review or special permit. But, but um, in terms of like the spoke, I mean, we're talking about trying to, if the goal is to expedite the permitting right. by letting the building commissioner decide everything, um, which I would be a little, but, you know, so I'm just trying to understand, like, in a normal process, would Garcia's shifting from an Italian restaurant to a Mexican restaurant, would that have, would the building commissioner, you know, have just said, that's fine, it's not a change in use, there's no real external changes to the building other than the paint color, Right. Um, would he have just approved that with the conditions? Normally? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So in Article 11, there is a provision, as Jenna mentioned, that the building commissioner can approve that. And if the only changes outside are to signs or, you know, paint color, then it, it can be administratively approved. And so the change to Garcia's right could have happened without, um, you know, through site, you know, through the administrative approval. But they mm -hmm. added outdoor dining and they wanted to stay open later. So that would have triggered them to be a class two restaurant and go through a special permit process. So, um, but article 14 allowed that to happen, you know, administratively. So 
a transition so, from one space to a from a restaurant to a restaurant may not trigger a uh, site plan review or a special permit now what what would happen though for instance in those examples if they want to stay open later or have outdoor dining or make some changes outside then that does trigger you know a land use permit so 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 Nate um to kind of get back to the crux of Janet's question this is not a discussion about article 14 no this is an art this is a discussion of, that is prompted by lessons learned from our experience with the temporary Article 14. And we're trying to translate some of those uh, lessons into other parts of the of the code. Right. So I think, you know, previously, even before COVID, staff had thought that the designation of class one and class two and class three food and drink establishments was somewhat antiquated and arbitrary, right? So um, you know, just because you might be open later than 1130, all of a sudden you need a special permit, even if you're the exact same thing as a restaurant that's open, closes a half hour earlier and the permitting paths were different. And so um, with, with the temporary measures in article 14, it really prompted staff to say, let's examine just the food and drink establishment piece, right? And well, how can we clarify or, you know, change the uses to capture really what's happening on the ground in terms of establishments? You know, is there, and because there are bars and before, there really wasn't a category for bars without food. And the so, building commissioner needs to, you know, put a proposed use into a category that most closely identifies with in our, in our zoning bylaw. So that's, you know, that's a job of the building commissioner. So it could be that like the Drake becomes, you know, we have a dance hall, grange, like assembly hall space. And, you know, it's like, oh, wow, is that what it is? But not really. And so um, I think, you know, the thought was, okay, well, from article 14, we realized we can through administrative approval Put conditions on uses and not you know not see those impacts and then the ones that maybe are you know are large enough that they would still need you know permitting they, they would go to that so right doug so janet to your point right i mean I, I feel like article 14 putting that in there is a is somewhat misleading and i mean this, is, this is really a, a a an improvement to the categories in the food and drink establishments right so, doug could i follow have a follow-up question yeah. So just because I actually just really was completely lost. Um, and I, I think I've been found, but I'm not sure. Um, so sticking with Garcia's, so Garcia's was a class one restaurant um, serving food and drink, and they wanted to stay open later, which would have made them class two. And then they wanted to do outdoor dining and I guess music, I don't know. And so under in the old days, that would have triggered a special permit requirement, not particularly the change, you know, change in right. ownership, but adding that. So they would have gone to the ZBA and say, hey, we want to stay open late. We're going to have music piped outside and we're going to have people, you know, drinking margaritas, which, by the way, were quite tasty when I went. Um, and and that would be a discretionary permit. The ZBA could have said, well, you know, wait, you're too close to some housing, blah, 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 blah you know, lights off at 1230 or something like that. So that would, and they could, the ZBA could have said, no, you just can't stay open late. And so under your new, the, your proposed revisions, that whole thing, like Garcia's could become a new company, a new restaurant, but outdoor dining, outdoor music and staying open late would be site plan review. It would come to the planning board. It would be, we couldn't say no if it met all the criteria. Um, you know, and and so that's it. So that is that the difference now? Am I seeing that correctly? Well, you know, you can still deny a site plan review application, but yes, I mean that's that's the difference. Is that you know instead of it being a discretionary special permit, it's site plan review, and so you know there still can be conditions put on those uses. And so what we were finding, um, you know, even like I said, even before COVID, a restaurant like that, that change it would have the standard set of fifty conditions that would be the same for those restaurants and they were always being approved by the zba right so although it's discretionary there wasn't there really wasn't one that was turned down unless it was you know it withdrew or it came back but you know because the zba would work to get those same conditions mm -hmm. you know decibels at the property line you know things that are in the bylaw right so having a management plan uh, certain responses to complaints and so you know we found well why is this a special permit if they're always being approved we can we can incorporate those standard sets of conditions into um, you know, the management plan so that every restaurant has to have the same type of management plan and you know, same type of 
um, conditions can be placed on it. So it doesn't need to be a special permit. It can be site plan review. And then the, in, in, in both, in both like how we do it now and the, your suggestion, people, abutters will be notified, members of the public will be notified and people can participate in a public hearing. Is that right? Right. And so, like you said before, you know, if there's those few, you know, there's three instances in the bylaw where it can be a, approved administratively and we're not changing those. Those are still the case. You okay. know, if there's no changes to the exterior uh, except for signs and um, minor alterations that the building commissioner doesn't think changes the site plan. And so those are already in the bylaw. They have been for a while. And so yeah. actually in Article 11, what we're doing is we're actually saying the building commissioner can approve them administratively, but they can also deny them or approve them with conditions. And so right now the building commissioner is putting conditions on those uses, but the bylaw doesn't explicitly say that the, that you know, the building commissioner has that authority. Okay. And so the, the significant change to Article 11 now is actually saying the building commissioner can put conditions on that or deny it or kick it to the board for site plan review, right? So the building com commissioner could say, okay, well, this, this space has been problematic. It is on the periphery. The neighbors often complain, you know, you're coming in, you're a new establishment, but you still want to be open late. Um, I'm not going to approve that administratively. It's still going to go through a permit process because, uh, you know, there's, you know, there's just something perhaps about that space or, you know, the buffering to a neighbor. So, um, you know, having that language in the bylaw saying that the building commissioner could deny it administratively is something that isn't clear right now that could happen. And so to make that change in Article 11, that's, I mean, that's really the, the significant yeah. change to Article 11. Yeah. yeah, I had, I had like a fast and easier way to make that change that was less like red. So we can talk about that. <laughs> sure. So, so. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Tom. Thanks, Doug. I just wanted to make a quick note that um, you may not all know this, and I know that this doesn't have to do with the functionality or performance or particularly the zones, but um, the design review board saw every single one of those as well, um, you know, from an exterior perspective. So regardless of what that approval process looked like, um, while they were expedited, they were still under certain visual criteria in the public domain by the DRB. So I just wanted to make sure that we were aware that that was happening, um, despite the fact that some of these things were, um, let's just say, um, streamlined in terms of their approvals. Um, they were still overseen, at least from, from an exterior and um, public impact perspective. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That's a good point, right? So even, you know, Initially, when the owner for you know the building Garcia's was in, you know, a while ago, wanted to demolish it, that would still have to go through a historical commission, or you know, if there's any changes to the right of way, that would have to be reviewed by town council. So we're not we're not excusing any other you know any other board review. It's really uh, you know the land use permitting, special permit or site plan review that's being recategorized. So I will share my screen. I'll show the use chart, um, and then we can move through the. Um, so, you know, like I said, like we had in the, um, in the presentation, there's, you know, this is a whole new section 3.352. Uh, so there's the restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar establishment where food is served at all times. And so, you know, really essentially if it has a kitchen or it's serving food, the food has to be, um, you know, uh, uh kind of the, the main portion of that. It can't be, um, you know, a few, a little food, but really the, the major service is alcohol. I mean, it, it could be, but really we're saying the food has to be there. Then there's a bar with no food served, a nightclub, and anything with over 250. And the permitting is just restricted to those few districts. And so the first one is by site plan review and the others are by special permit. So, um, you know, so, so if someone came in and was proposing, like I said, to have a new space that is a restaurant during the day and then a bar at night, they currently, the way this is uh, proposed is they would have a, both a site plan review and a special permit. So Nate, mm -hmm. um, you used the Moan and Dove as an example of a bar with no food. Right. But, you know, that's not a category that's previously existed and I believe the reason that they serve peanuts in that uh, establishment is because we didn't allow bars with no food. 
So oh. since they've traditionally done that, would you consider that they would need a site plan review or would they need a special permit the way they currently operate? No, so the, um, so the, you know, they're a class two, but the, um, so that leads me to my uh, points dug below. Um, you know, for every, every food and drink establishment, we have these standards and conditions that they would have to meet. And, you know, we say as applicable. And so the state uh, board of um, alcoholic, you know, alcohol and beverage control, and then the Amherst board of licensing commissioners, the state allows bars to serve prepackaged food or, um, you know, say like appetizers or something. There's, you know, some, some phrase they use. So the moan and dove would be, you know, they would, you know, they wouldn't, it would be considered a bar with no food. They would fall into that category. So, you know, serving peanuts doesn't make them a restaurant uh, at all. It would keep them in that category. And, so, you're saying, so how would we, how would we make sure that that's the way no food was interpreted? So the so, building commission you know, what, understands. What, yeah, so the building I, I commission just imagine understands getting that. into a fight with an applicant about, hey, I, I serve peanuts, so I can just do a site plan review. Well, I think that, um, okay. So yeah, I, I don't wanna jump around. So in, um, in definitions of a restaurant, we have, we, ha we clarify that. Okay. So, so someone, I mean, right. So to your point, so we have, we have the definition of a bar, a food and drink establishment or a part of such an establishment. So this is, you know, already in the, in the definitions devoted primarily to the service and consumption of alcoholic beverages on the premises and in which the service of food may be incidental. And so someone couldn't come in and argue that, you know, I'm going to have nachos and sausages but I'm going to have a 20, 20 taps and, you know, it's a, it's a restaurant. So, um, okay. so since we're in article 12, we're deleting drive up restaurant because it's, it's really never used. And sorry for all the scrolling, but we have the definition of restaurant in there and that's not changing. Um, just so everyone can see it. It's an establishment or part of an established establishment devoted primarily to the service and consumption of food and beverages on the premises. Any such establishment shall be considered a restaurant if the service of food is its primary activity and the service of alcoholic beverages, if any, is incidental to the sale, service, and consumption of food and non-alcoholic beverages. So, you know, those are existing definitions that would still apply. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, good questions because, right, I think, Right. If you saw this, you'd say, "What? Well, what does? I mean, I, I even question that. What does it mean? No food served." And you know, Rob said, "Well, the Board of Licensing Commissioners in the state have a definition for what that means." So, well, then why do you need the words "with no food served"? Why not just say "bar"? I think. Well, for for us, it's a clarification um, because um, up here we say "bar with food." So there are restaurants or bars that serve food, right? And we're not trying to say it's a restaurant, it's a bar with food, so. Okay. Um, do you wanna continue or shall I call on Bruce? Uh, if Bruce has, a, I mean, I guess we can, I'm okay with. Okay, hey Bruce, come on up. Oh, I'll call, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, this is interesting. Oh, my daughter's calling, I'm gonna to have to just tell her to go away. Um, she might be persistent. Um, so, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, you've kind of hit that uh, by the de by the deletion of that definition of uh, of the uh, drive up. But for me, I guess it it seems to me that the the uh, the current uh, three point three five two food and drink establishments. Um, restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, and similar place is a class one. Class two is restaurant or bar, and class three is drive-up restaurant. So we're basically deleting class three um, altogether. So, um, so I guess what I'm seeing is that we're essentially replacing um, class one and class two with uh, two, 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 uh, two categories with four categories 
and we're deleting one of the existing categories because as you said earlier, if I understood you correctly, Nate, that we don't need it because it's, it can be covered by as an accessory use. So is that, is that, that's a broad summary of what's happening here, right? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a yeah, it's a, it's a one goes topic. away, two becomes four. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's um, that's good. Now the second question that I had was the occupancy, the two hundred and fifty person occupancy. Um, when, when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, golly, that's a big place. You know, I was thinking of two hundred fifty people. I was thinking that's. Uh, 50 tables with five people and uh, and I was thinking well wow, that's huge and I uh, I was thinking how did that uh, how was that the uh, what was the process for determining that to be the threshold well that's still the question but but I now understand that we're talking code definitions of occupancy and so it, it, it doesn't translate to 50 tables with uh, five people so much but it's still pretty big so the question remains, although I've, 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 uh, I've, I've um, uh, reeled in my apprehension a little, um, what is the rationale for choosing 250 occupants as the threshold uh, that basically changes the first um, or any of those categories into, well, actually it, it, it makes most, uh, it has most impact with a restaurant because the other two establishments are already in the uh, category of requiring um, special permits. So uh, the, 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 the significance is that uh, the restaurant cafe, if it's more than 250, shifts from a site plan review to a uh, special permit from the CBA. So what's the rationale or how, what, what's the process for determining that 250 was the, uh, was the threshold? Sure. Yeah. The, the spaghetti stuck to the wall with that number. Um, no, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, the, uh, you know, it could, it could fluctuate. And so some of it was, um, you know, if it's, if it's too small, then, you know, right, everything could be triggered into a special permit because it's right. As you said, Bruce, um, that it's not the number of tables and chairs, it's the occupant capacity based on code. And so um, that's a little different than, Oh, you know, we have seating for 30, but, you know, the code might allow up to 70 or something, right? They might want to have spacious seating, but the size of the space allows a, a bigger occupancy load. And so, you know, 250 was thought of as a, a size where you start to have, or you could have impacts, right, um, to, to the outside of the, of the property or to surroundings in terms of queuing, noise, um, you know, parking. Uh, but it could be it could be different. It could be 200. I mean, there isn't necessarily. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's any uh, code um, or regulation that says 250 occupants. I think it was something that the building commissioner and Maureen had looked at in terms of the size of existing restaurants and what had been permitted and what the you know occupancy loads were. So, um, you know, currently there's probably uh, two or three establishments that have the 250 occupancy load, right? So um, down on University Drive, the the hangar um, space, uh, right? So it's it's a pretty big space um, that you know that has a over 250, um, and there, I think there's one other. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I you know I you know we, I think it's a good discussion point. You know, would would 200 uh, be better? Um, you know, I don't. You know, I, I could we could look into that. Like, what exactly? does it mean? What are the factors code-wise? Hey, Nate, mm -hmm. could you scroll up a little bit higher to the, or, or off to the left? I'd like to see the category numbers, because I think, no, up, 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 up to, show me the three point, okay, you see how under bylaw it says oh, yes. 3.352? Yes. Yeah, those all say 325. It's yeah, a trans Yeah. 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 That was okay. a slight, that was a dyslexic moment. Um, okay. All right, yeah, Janet. I, I, I see that now. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Janet? So I think I need, uh, you know, I need help. In, and I think, I assume maybe my fellow board members need too to figure out what are the changes, what, what are the existing rules and what are the changes? Because when I looked at this chart, I actually kind of glanced at it because I thought, oh, that's just the use table. 
And I didn't realize, oh, this is the new proposed use table. So you're removing a lot of language from the existing 3.352, like the limiting of restaurants to 30 seats and the BN that's gone. Um, so a lot, you know, so I, you know, when I look at this, you know, freshly, I realize, you know, what what is the, you know, I can look at them and compare them and go line by line, but I think it'd be better for all of us if we could just say, here are the changes. Um, you know, I'm kind yeah, we, of, you know, we, we found that to be really difficult because of the way the chart's organized to to cross out everything and then have the new conditions. Really, it's I mean, it's almost really you're comparing one, you know, one chart to another chart. It's it's really difficult to do a line by line. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't use this chart format because it's so unfriendly to begin with, but maybe saying, you know, you know, any restaurant in the BN can now have, there's no limit on the capacity of it, right? It could be, you know, it could be a restaurant with two, you know, 30 seats or 90 seats. And so that has gone away. So, you know, that would be an important fact to know. Um, that might be a good idea or a bad idea, but I, I think we have to know that there is an idea and what that is. And so, um, so I also wondered like what happens if a drive-through someone applied for a drive-through thing? Like where did that, does that land a special permit? Or does that land as site plan review? But those are sort of smaller things. Um, so, so what I started to do was like try to understand, you know. So, you know, one thing that kind of irked me, just getting my feelings out, is the word arbitrary distinctions between class one and class two, because it seemed to me that there were two significant distinctions. One was, you know, what how big is it and what time does it close? And so I think um you know, you're losing that, dis the, the closing time um, was a trigger to, to go from class one to class, or a, a restaurant or bar that closes at 1130 is class one, um, I think. And then someone who stays open later is class two and you need a special permit. And I think that's not so hard to understand why they made that distinction, you know, in a town of many youthful people who go out at 10 o'clock at night in a town of many people who go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. And we have lots of people living downtown and in, in and around village centers where that would be important for them to know, especially if we're adding in outdoor seating, outdoor music that can go on past 1130 at night. And so when I started to sort of put them all together, I was just like, okay, so now, you know, we can have restaurants that have capacity or bars with food that have capacity up to 240 people, 45, open all night with outdoors, outdoors seating and music. And, you know, on one hand, I feel like, oh, I'm living in Paris. You know, this is so exciting, although I think Paris is kind of quieter, maybe. But it's it's like that's a huge change. And there, I think there's a reason for those dis distinctions. And we should sort of mull about whether we want to let go of those and how big is too big, maybe. Um, my other point, which I think is, I, I think might just be a typo, is when we were looking at Article 5 um, accessory uses, basically, it seemed to expand outdoor dining, cafes, live music to any principal use in Section 3.3, which is the entire use chart. And so it sounded like any use found in section 3.3 in you know the five zoning districts could have outdoor dining and outdoor music and i just i think that must be a typo because it, you know that would extend to a gas station recreational marijuana retailer a lumber yard in the com you know a rental you know it's just i i just i i just thought that it seems like that was where the floodgates just opened and i just thought i don't think you meant that well, so, I'll um, start with your first one. So in terms of a class one and class two now, you know, if a restaurant wants to stay open till midnight, you know, all of a sudden it needs a special permit, even if most of its business is, you know, in the afternoon and evening. And so, like I said, be even before COVID, staff had realized that the conditions placed on class two and class one were the same. And so from a permitting standpoint, it's arbitrary because class twos were always permitted, right? There was, they really weren't denied. And the conditions were the same. And so, you know, from staff's perspective, if, you know, I was going to show these standards and conditions. So, you know, there's a standard set of conditions that will be, that are applied to, you know, class one and class two now. And those conditions that are placed through a special permit process 
allow enforcement and inspection services and police to manage those, those places without any incident, right? So typically they actually operate without having any complaints. And so to have a special permit process for something that uh, follows the conditions and there aren't complaints, um, you know, staff was saying, well, why, why keep it a special permit? Um, and so the, the real, um, um, you know, question would be if, if a restaurant is a restaurant and then all of a sudden it turns into a bar with no food served, then it still needs a special permit, right? So if a restaurant like the monkey bar is a restaurant during the day and actually turns into a bar at night, that would be, um, you know, a two permit cat, two permit establishment because it really has two principal uses then. And so, you know, we're not, um, you know, if a restaurant really is serving food as its primary um, function until 1 a.m., then we're saying that's, you know, is that, we're saying that's good. If, you know, there's a distinction then if it's, you know, the primary service is consumption of alcohol, then it be becomes a bar. Even if they want to say it's a restaurant or the name says it's a restaurant, you know, we'll look at how it's being used. Um, so, and then so Nate, you're, you're saying that's, that some of the criteria about the time and the distance to residential zones and those kinds of things that are in the current zoning uh, bylaw are not really having any material effect on the conditions or the rate of approval. Right, or the complaints. Or right? the complaints. So, so, so after they've been approved, they're not, they're, it's immaterial, those, those conditions in the bylaw, right? So uh -huh. they're not, they're not coming into play. So what we are saying is, you know, that they have to be subject to review and approval by the Board of Licensing Commissioners, subject to other state and local codes, that the accessory uses would apply. And so right now, what's happening is, right, a drive through restaurant, um, typically the drive through is accessory to the restaurant, a cafe or other thing. You know, the only time there would be just a drive through the way we had defined it in the bylaw was, all your service is coming through a drive-through window. Um, and really there's no, you know, that, I don't know if there's ever been, um, a, you know, a drive-through as we had defined it uh, in Amherst. Um, we're saying that, you know, we, for every food and drink establishment, they need all these plans, you know, site plan, floor plan, a layout plan with occupant capacity for indoor and outdoor dining, a patron management plan, uh, I should say plan for the interior and exterior, a general management plan, parking and traffic. Um, and the management plan would include such things as their hours of operation, trash and refuse storage, uh, outdoor dining, queuing, signage, lighting, uh, response to complaints, employee parking and other information. And so, you know, what's happened with article 14, we require all these things in the management plan and they become, you know, part of the decision the building commission issues. So if they say that they're gonna have trash stored indoors and it's gonna be picked up daily and we find out that they put a dumpster outside, then that violates their management plan. And that, you know, that becomes, um, you, know, in a, you know, it can be an enforcement order against that establishment. And so by requiring all these things up front, whether or not it's by special permanent site plan review or administrative approval, all of this has to be met. Um, it provides enough information for staff to, you know, to have that administrative approval with, with conditions. Um, you know, so, you know, just going on, you know, I, you know, electric ID if alcohol served, um, on-site uh, training, staff training and certifications for crowd control and tips, um, you know, a condition about reusable tableware for outdoor service, uh, the way it should be cleaned, uh, and outdoor furniture shall be placed to meet all egress uh, clearances uh, and requirements. And so, you know, those are the standards and conditions that would be applied to, um, to every use that would come in you know, in addition to other conditions through permitting. Okay. Uh, have we covered all the material you wanted to present or do you want to go on to another piece of information? Oh, just go on. So for, I mean, so it is interesting. So, um, so for article five, I mean, I, we could stop and pause for a minute because then there's article five, the accessory uses were changing, um, article 11 and then article 12, uh, like I showed the few changes to the definition. So. Um, there's three more articles that are being proposed to change. Um, and well, so as see, Janet mentioned, I, I do see that Bruce has his hand yeah. up. So why don't we let him ask a question? Thanks, Doug. I, I'm, uh, I'm not done with the 250 threshold yet. So I had a follow-up question. 
um, and and I, I um, basically Nate uh, said something about spaghettis and walls and so forth, and then went on to say that it was a, um, a good uh, a number that felt right for, for for staff, I guess, and and perhaps other other others. Um, I think you said there were three establishments in town that uh, were at or above that limit. So my follow-up question on that was, uh, take Johnny's, for example, Johnny's Tavern. Um, I'd be interested in, in knowing what the occupancy uh, occupancies are for some of the restaurants in, uh, in town. So we kind of know whether, 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 whether perhaps dropping that down to 200 would be good or not, because I, I really don't know what the occupancy levels of the various uh, food and drink establishments around town are. And I think I would need to know that in order to um, be intelligent about uh, judging whether that 250 is the right number or not. Mm -hmm. No, that, you know, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that's important to have. Okay, that's good. So that, that's information that will will right. be forthcoming. Thank you. Right. And, you know, I, it, it's also, you know, if a space, for instance, um, you know, Johnny's could be under that, right. But what if there is an adjacent space that they open up to after hours and their occupancy increases? So, you know, then all of a sudden they become a new use. So um, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't change what, what it is now, but I do think, right. Looking at what is, what it is and what, you know, what is two is 250 appropriate. Um, yeah. So for, yes, I'd just like to know uh, what we're talking about here because it's a it's it's a big number and it's it's a number that uh, triggers uh, the 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 fourth of the new categories. So obviously it's important, and I think we should uh, know what the uh, what the, what what some of the key uh, establishments around town are, and if they have uh, multiple lives, you know, before and after midnight or something like that, then we should know the. Uh, occupancies for their various lives as well as the established, you know, as, right. so whatever, whatever will mm -hmm. help us make a, uh, you know, a, a good decision about that number. Sure. So for article five, you know, it's really the, um, you know, 5.04, the accessory uses and retail business and consumer service uses. And so what's shown in, uh, on the screen, everything in red strike through is, would, is proposed to be removed and bold italics is proposed to be inserted. So, you know, as Janet mentioned, right, in BG, BL, B, BBC, BN, and COM, the five districts, um, you know, to a principal use authorized by section three and subject to the same review as the required principal use. So we're deleting, you know, one, two, and three in part because we're, we no longer have, you know, we never had, for instance, in number one, we say a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, refreshment stand, drive up, fast food eatery or sim similar eating establishment. And so now that we're coming with proposing new definitions in 3.352, uh, we'd like to remove number one. I mean, we never even had a, an, a, a definition for cafeteria or refreshment stand. It was just kind of an odd, um, you know, relic. Uh, number two, you know, was a bakery, deli, or, deli or, or other similar establishment for the production and sale of food and beverage. And so we're saying, again, that's somewhat redundant to the new categories we're proposing. And then a retail store or convenience store selling prepared or packaged food. Um, you know, and the building commissioner, you know, really thought that, you know, a, a, you know, a principal use authorized by section three and subject to the same review. So, um, you know, it's really only, um, in those five districts, it's only seasonal outdoor dining, including sidewalk cafes, courtyards, or terrace dining, or similar uses may be permitted in those districts as print as you know an accessory use to a principal use. And so I agree. You know, Janet might say, "Well, wow, so that that could allow um, you know some some use you wouldn't expect to have outdoor dining or some sidewalk seating or you know terrace dining." And we're saying, sure. Why not, right? It, it still has to go through some review, but why? Why are we? Why are we restricting it in those? In what is really our commercial cores in our downtown and village centers? Um, in five point oh four one zero, the way this had worked was it said that you know really the outdoor dining would only be in place November one through April one, and what we've learned is that the outdoor season. Can can be you know earlier or longer. It can be longer than that. And so we're saying now any structure, framework, you know, planter box, etc., 
uh, shall remain in the outdoor dining area so long as the use is active and operational. And so really, you know, if someone wants to propose outdoor dining year round um, and they think patrons will use it, you know, that's something that it, it could happen. Um, so, you know, a corollary to that is this change in uh, this, you know, 5.0413, where we say no facility shall be equipped with freestanding heating or cooling devices or served by the HVAC system of adjacent uh, and associated buildings, except for fans. You know, when we started having outdoor dining, we do allow, um, you know, a gas powered heaters and they are inspected by fire. Uh, there's codes required for those. And so we're proposing to delete that statement, which would allow for, you know, a longer season of outdoor dining. Um, and so we see that as a good thing, you know, that we're allowing, you know, these, you know, planter boxes, whatever, you know, we have them out there now, right? We have it uh, in a number of spaces downtown that those could remain um, as part of, you know, accessory use, as long as the, the you know, principal use is op operational. So if, say, a restaurant closes seasonally, they close, you know, January, February, March every year, and then they have outdoor dining, the outdoor dining would have to be removed for those three months that they're no longer operational. Um, and then, um, you know, just going down through Article 5, we struck a restaurant bar or inn and said any principal use in Section 3. Um, you know, again, live or pre-recorded pre music, um, you know, it's still everything else um, with this, you know, is still the same in terms of the conditions. And um, drive through facilities, we're still allowing. We just removed the reference to the restaurant section because it's no longer there. And so those are the changes to Article 5. All right. We have three people with, com with hands raised. So mm -hmm. many questions for you, Nate. Sure. Karen. Yeah, so I, I congratulate you on this because we do want to encourage a vibrant downtown. And you made pretty clear that if there are complaints, and first of all, you've tried this out, there were no complaints, of course, it was COVID time. But I think it's great to simplify this and still have um, the, you know, the control that you said that we would still have if there are complaints there, things will will be addressed. There are so many things that are um, going to be looked out for. So I'm very much in favor of this. I, I don't see a problem and I, I congratulate you on this. All right, thanks, Karen. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, and thanks, Dave. My question is actually pretty pretty quick. On five zero four one zero, is just um, is the I'm just wondering the November first to April first is that in place as much for like snow removal purposes and just allowing the you know the ability to remove snow during those off seasons. Um, and I'm just you know envisioning a situation where someone you know leaves their their planning boxes and tables and stuff out there, and then it just ends up um, you know just collecting. Uh, snow through the the season and might make it more difficult for for the area to be maintained. But uh, in principle, I like it. I think if we keep it. They want to tighten up the language or something just to have some more definitions of a tighter, more discrete definition of what active and operational is. But bigger question is, is that really there to to help with snow removal? Right. Yeah. No. So I think originally it was for that, and the thought was that who would want to have outdoor or seasonal dining in the winter. But what we found is, you know, uh, some places might. So um, when it says that any structure shall remain as long as the use is active and operational, that's the primary use. So, um, you know, I don't think we would wanna have in the zoning bylaw um, something too detailed about that, but I think we could, we could um, perhaps hold it into a standard and condition uh, in the use chart to say something about, you know, um, uh, something about having a, or we could fold into the management plan that they have snow removal in outdoor dining areas as part of the management plan. So, you know, that, that could become a required um, piece of information. But yeah, so I, you know, I think that's some of the reason it wasn't there now or now, but we're finding that, you know, maybe not everyone wants to stay open at those in, during those months, but some might. Very good. Thanks. Nate, uh, 
I think it would be useful to put the word primary before use, because when I first read this, I thought you were saying, as long as there's outdoor dining use, right. it can stay in place. But you said earlier, as long as the indoor food is, is continuing, these could stay, so. Yeah, yeah, so I, yeah, I think originally we had said the principal use is active and operational. Um, all right, well, I think some way to clarify that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Janet, I'm gonna let Chris go first. I, I assume, Chris, you have a comment about this discussion? I am not sure what I wanted to say. I'm sorry, the thought has fled my mind. So Okay, well, we can come back to you. Janet. We're definitely covering a lot of ground here. So, so when when Nate when you say you know why not let anybody do outdoor dining or in in you know these five four or five districts and you know have outdoor music and things like I'm not against precluding somebody from having an outdoor event like a food event or having a food truck and you know a bank having a celebration that way but you know I, be, you need to before you bring this back to us list all the uses that would include because I'm looking at you know funeral establishments studios and repair shops bike mechanic vets offices um, medical uses a dental library um, a potter um, medical marijuana treatment center dispensaries um, you know it just goes on and on and on and do we really want to have every business in these, you know, our commercial and, you know, neighborhood, you know, in our, in our downtown and village centers, able to serve food and have outdoor music, you know, year round. And, you know, are we going to, I just, I just find that a little much. I mean, we've gone from, yeah, we want to encourage outdoor dining and have some music with eating, you know, and maybe with a bar to let's just do it everywhere all the time. And, you know, if it's all site plan review, there's no way to say no to it other than, you know, I mean, you, you know, if they hit the criteria, you can't say no. And so I think it's just, it's like, this is the floodgates. I think, you know, let's focus on what we're really trying to get, which is keep our restaurants engaged, you know, make our downtown more lively. If a bank wants to have an outdoor event with music and, um, you know, and or eating, you know, they can do that on a, you know, one-off kind of basis, get a permit for that. But do we want the Bank of America playing, you know, outdoor music 24 seven, like a Disney show or every business. And so I, I think it's gone too far. And I don't, I'm not sure it's, I can't support just saying any use in 3.3, unless we see that list of what could, what could be. And I, I really would, and I think it's going to be a really long list. But I think, and you know, we're saying it here, just, subject to the same of, review as, and we say it kind of differently down here under a special permit or a site plan review, whichever is required for the principal use. So we're not saying that it can happen. We're saying that, you know, currently it can only happen if it was related to one, two or three. We're saying, you know, if a use is allowed by special permit, then those could happen at, as an accessory use by a special permit. And so if we're already allowing the principal use, you know, we're saying, why not encourage some accessory use? And so Right now, there actually is no one-off. Let's have someone do music for a day or two. There really isn't a use. That, uh, really, that would have to be not denied. But it's allowed to happen. But there really is no permitting mechanism right now in the bylaw to allow that to happen. Well, so, you know, the new, the new bakery um, downtown wants to have some music or maybe a chair or two. And we'd say, well, actually, you can't have it right now if you're, say, not in these districts. But uh, we allow, it would be allowed to happen. And so... Um, you know, I think, you know, the building commissioner really doesn't think that this is going to open the floodgates, right? I think he, he thinks it as, as, you know, we're already allowing people who come in to say, oh, we want to have a one-time event, um, you know, on our sidewalks in front of our store. And he'd say, sure, we'll give, you know, we're going to place conditions on it. And here's how it's going to happen, whether or not it's actually uh, explicitly allowed in the bylaw. But now we're, we're actually having a provision to say, Yes, it's a it's an accessory use, and now we can we can permit it and put conditions on it according to the bylaw, without having to you know have um, kind of some you know kind of informal process. We're trying to formalize it because the town gets a lot of requests like this actually for so, small events or one time event or for a business to do something. So they um, 
I think we should just hone in on what you want to do. Do you really want to send the I the optician to get a ZBA special permit to have a, a music or food event in front of his store? Or do you want to just set, you know, like, I mean, it, if, if the building commissioner needs, you know, permission for that kind of one-off event, I think that's fine. But I really don't think that, I mean, when you look at the list, it's a list of basically food related things. And so, and that's related to outdoor dining. Do we want to have CVS open up a, you know, a, an outdoor restaurant in its parking lot? I don't know, you can say, well, why not? And you can just, just go through every possible business, you know, or use in, and, and also calm is a really huge amount of uses. Um, and so I just think it's like opening the door too much. If the building commissioner feels like he needs permission in the bylaw to do these kind of temporary permits, let's just do that. Let's just focus on what he's looking for and not opening the floodgates. All right, thank you, Janet. Um, Bruce. Um, I just want to respond to Janet a little on this. I, I'm, I'm not so concerned, uh, Janet, as, as you are. And um, maybe I should be, but it's uh, but it was when you were suggesting or that someone would have to go through uh, our, uh, section three point three and and identify kind of like you're sorting sheep, you know, with a gate that does this. Um, I I don't think we can do that. I think that that would be uh, that would be too leading the leading the the reader or the whatever by the nose. My sense is that um, I just have the sense that, well, if people did want to be creative and, and uh, if a funeral parlor did have some brand new idea, which may turn out to in 20 years be a, a new thing, I don't see that we need to stand in the way of that. I think that well, there is a mechanism in place that uh, if somebody really does have an odd idea about how funeral homes could become uh, food establishments in some strange way let them make their case and because we've got a, a structure uh, through the permitting process that will allow that uh, and it, it doesn't seem to me that we're at risk here so i i'm you you, you can um, push back on this a bit but but i'm not as concerned as you are about this because we have this structure for evaluating uh, and, uh, and, and reviewing and permitting these things. So I, I would prefer not to make a big long list, if it is a big long list, of what might be clandestine or whatever the word is, food and uh, drink establishments, but just let the, uh, let the creative juices of the community flow, if indeed that's what they have, if they want to. But my guess is that um, that that where that 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 that, that, that the building commission is right that the floodgates that there's, there's going to be no flood of activity here so i don't think we need to presume that there might be and then try and second guess it all right bruce thank you very much chris i now see your hand maybe you've remembered what you wanted to say I did. I remembered what I wanted to say, and I also wanted to say something about accessory uses. So there is a kind of a definition of accessory uses in Section 5.00. The topic uh, or the uh, title of that section is general. But anyway, it says any use which is in Hampshire County customarily accessory and incidental to a per permitted principal use shall be permitted on the same lot with the principal use or in a lot adjacent there too, and then it goes on. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the building commissioner can go back and look at this paragraph and realize that the accessory use that is going to be permitted has to have some relationship to the principal use in a customary way in Hampshire County. So um, that you know could prevent um, some of the things that Janet is fearful about happening. The building commissioner will say, well, outdoor dining isn't really um, customarily accessory to X use in uh, section three of the of the bylaw, so we're not going to allow it here. So that was one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, in response to Andrew's <clears throat> comment about leaving uh, furniture and things outside that are associated with outdoor dining, 
Um, many of the outdoor dining places that we see now are either on the sidewalk or in the street. Um, and that's a result of Article 14. And it's also a result of things that the, that the state has done at the state level to allow cities and towns to allow um, dining and drinking in the public way. And um, the building, uh, the uh, town manager has been given some authority over the public way by a town council to allow those things to occur. But those things require an agreement between the town and the entity that's offering these services. So the town could say um, on the sidewalks, for instance, or in the street, we don't want you to have those there from November to April because we need to plow the sidewalk. But in places where um, it, you know, it's a private privately owned patio or whatever, it may be quite appropriate to leave them there. So we didn't want to have this restriction that would keep, you know, uh, entities that wanted to pursue this, that were not in the public way and were not getting in the way of the snowplows and things from being able to do this. So I think that would, you know, tend to restrict some of the things that Andrew was um, concerned about. Okay, thank you, Prince. Janet, is this a new point? I, I think you've made your concerns pretty okay. clear. I have a question. Um, so if the goal is to sort of streamline permitting and at the same time, people are getting site plan review permits or special permits and they all look kind of the same and no one's been said no to. So here's my question is, what if we changed everything to site plan review, which gave us the chance to say no um, it's a discretionary permit, and it gives a little bit more heft to saying we'd like to put these conditions on. Also, site plan review. I mean, do special. You mean, permit. Do you mean special permit? I'm sorry, special permit. Like, why don't we shift everything to special permit because it's a discretionary permit, and it has more criteria dealing with kind of, you know, well-being of the community and nearby residents, um, just to give the board a little more heft in terms of putting conditions in because it doesn't seem like going to site plan review would speed up anything versus special permit so you know why not just keep the discretionary permit so there's a little more control great right, thank you nate do you have any comment yeah i would say that um that's actually to me that's a statement saying we actually are trying to do you know we're somewhat discouraging restaurants or bars or other things from coming to town so you know, a discretionary permit is really, um, you know, it is discretionary. And I think a lot of businesses see that as a red flag when they're, when they're surveying a community. And so, you know, I'm not sure that a, a restaurant that's open um, or some of these here are the same as a bar with no food or a nightclub or a really large establishment. And so from staff's perspective, we would say that, you know, we think site plan review is more appropriate as, as we've categorized it and not to make it a special, a discretionary special permit. So, um, you know, a, special, a site plan review, you know, there are conditions can be placed on it, uh, but we're saying we actually want, we want to have this by site plan review. And in some instances, you know, class one is by site plan review. So um, we don't want to actually change it and reverse it and say, well, now let's make it special permit. Um, we'd rather have it be, a, you know, a site plan review use. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris, I see your hand again. Yes, I, I wanted to talk a little about where this goes from here. So if um, this is an appropriate time to do that, um, may yeah, I do that? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so the um, CRC, the Community Resources Committee, is going to be considering this on um, September 29th. And then I think that the um, intention is to bring this to town council sometime in October, so town council can um, refer it back to the planning board and to the CRC for public hearings. Um, there's a feeling of, I don't know, I guess pressure to some degree because Article 14 is um, expiring at the end of December. So there's a feeling to want to do something um, before Article 14 expires to allow these things to happen. So I just wanted to let you know that and um, certainly the planning board will have you know, more time to discuss this, um, but that's kind of the, the schedule that is going forward that is being planned. Okay, so the, only, thanks, yeah, the only thing is I, I haven't shown article 11. So I, you know, I did do article 12 with the definitions. I don't, I'd like to share the okay. changes to article 11. 
and so every um, if that's visible, um, yep. You know, everything in red is proposed. We're not proposing to delete anything. We're proposing. That's a little too zoomed in. Is that legible? I can't. I don't know if that's. If that's yes. Yeah. Um, so you know these three. So we've what we've kind of done is reorganized. Uh, um, we're calling it administration and applicability, just to have it be a more accurate uh, section. Um, and we're saying site plan review shall not be required when, and we have these, you know, these sections listed, uh, 2.110, you know, 2.111, those are already in the bylaw. So those aren't anything new, they're red because we're renumbering them and reorganizing them. So we're all making them a subsection of when site plan review is not required. So these are, these are existing. There's no physical change to the exterior of the building or site. The only change to the exterior of a building or site includes the installation of signs in compliance with Article 8. Uh, a change of use is proposed and no physical changes to the exterior of a building or site will occur. And the building commissioner determines that the change will not conflict with the purpose of the bylaw and finds that the proposed use will not result in the need for further review under uh, section 11.243. So those are already in the bylaw. We're just proposing to you know, nest them differently and renumber them uh, minor alteration is also um, currently allowed. Uh, it's, it says uh, you, right here, what you just say, administrative approval for minor alteration. Um, so the so really the the big change now is we're inserting this eleven point two one two. So when no site plan or review is required, so that means for any of these these uses up up here, no physical changes, you know, signs. Uh, when um, there can be administrative approval in those instances up above. Um, but the building commissioner has to first authorize the work or the use for seed. And here's where we're saying that, you know, this language is taken from Article 14, um, two out of straddles, two pages. It says the building commissioner may approve, approve with conditions, or deny the proposal. Decisions shall be made in writing, filed with the town clerk, and kept on record with the conservation and development department. The building commissioner in consultation with the planning director shall be authorized to apply any design review criteria normally reviewed by the design review board. And so, you know, really this paragraph is the significant change to article 11. And what's happened under article 14, um, we've developed an application form and a set of plans and requirements that are submitted. So, the decision that the building building commissioner has been making under Article 14, you know, includes a management plan, includes a site plan or floor plan, and then includes conditions, and all that gets uh, signed and bundled and filed with the town clerk. And so we're proposing that that same process would continue to happen. And you know, Janet, you mentioned this earlier. So we already allow this to happen, but what isn't there is really the ability of the building commissioner. Uh, the bylaw is silent on whether the building commissioner could deny or approve with conditions. And we want to put that in, in writing to say that that can happen. Um, because sometimes the way regulations work is if it's silent, say it means it's not allowed, or if we say it can happen, it means it just has to happen without any conditions or denial, right? So if the bylaw says the building, so right now it says um, up above, it will say administrative approval for things that don't need site plan or view. And the way it's written, really, it's almost saying it, it has to be approved. Um, but we're saying, well, it doesn't have to be, it could be denied. Nate, your last sentence about uh, design review board right. criteria. Right. How would those work with this only applying in situations where there are no changes on the exterior? Well, they have um, signs. So we're saying signs could be. So, okay. you know, that's really the only instance. Okay, thank you. Tom. Yeah, I mean, my comment was similar, Doug. I mean, in the sense that what I'm what I'm hearing and clarify for me, Nate, because I'm I'm trying to follow, the way this is written, it seems as though authorization can be made by various people without the design review board's involvement. Is that the case, given a certain scenario? Because I think it's important that we imagine Design Review Board having the opportunity to look at those things. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's only in these instances above that that would apply. 
And so the next section in 11.24 in, in 11 says other review. The building commissioner may seek guidance in reviewing the above from other town staff and may require application to the design review board and or historical commission. So that's existing in the bylaw and that remains in the bylaw. So if the building commissioner felt that, you know, the sign was, um, although it meant article eight, um, it was really big, right? Or it was something that um, seemed like it should be reviewed. He, uh, the the building commissioner, right? Um, you know, could could recommend that the applicant apply to the design review board. I think my question Nate, is the may is different than it has to, and I guess my question is: is this actually changing the procedure by which things would normally be approved by design review board and are now? In, in the discretion of others who get to choose whether this may or may not be seen by DRB, or is this actually a, a completely separate set of circumstances that I'm not actually no. following? Yeah, so what it's saying is that the building, so right, right, what it's saying is the building commissioner is authorized to apply the principles, the design review criteria normally used by the design review board. So, you know, we have the, um, in section 3.325, whatever section that is, we have all those design review principles. Yeah. And what this say, section is actually saying is that the building commissioner can apply those to these administrative approvals, um, you know, without, you know, right now it wouldn't have to go to the design review board, right? So there's no changes happening necessarily. Right. But it's saying that the building commissioner can still apply those principles. Okay. So, uh, so to, Nate, to, if there needs to be conditions. So um, another way, if I can interpret what you're saying to say it is that this is not reducing the authority of the DRB and it's not reducing the scope of projects that they will see in any way. No, it's right. It's really giving the building commissioner the ability to apply those principles to the administrative approvals. Great. Thank you, Nate. Yep. Okay, Janet. So, um, it's, this is not this change really has nothing to do with like article 14 so that just let me just drift that away from me i thought that the easiest way i and not the easy not the easiest way but i thought that if you took the section um 11.212 which is giving the building commissioner like explicit authority i thought that it would read um or be better to see that information and i would have put it in 11. 210 in the beginning because the first statement is you know if site plan review is required the planning board has to approve and you can't do anything and the second statement is if site plan review is not required here's what the building commissioner can do right and then the next section you wouldn't have to do any red changes below that because it will just list site plan review is not required in these situations so i thought that in a weird way by putting um, the administrator approval section at the end, you sort of buried the lead and that it should just come up earlier. Like, you know, planning board, site plan review. If site plan review is not required, you go to the building commissioner, he gets the permit, he does the conditions, here's his power. And then you, then the question is, is like, oh, do I need site plan review? And then you would look at the list of when you don't need it. I mean, I just thought that flowed better and it just had less, you know, confusing changes to see. I don't think you'd have to change the numbering or anything. So that was my suggestion. Yeah, it was interesting actually. Yeah, the building commissioner like this format um, to say that, you know, site plan review should not be required when and everything is a subsection of that. So even the minor alterations and even this administrative approval is a subset of no site plan review shall be required. And so um, I, yeah, I actually had the that one part up uh, above previously, like you had suggested, and he he liked it the way it is, so that it's really it's really only when site plan review is not required is there administrative approval. Because if you had it its own section, it could be seen as competing with if it was at the same level as eleven point two one zero, it's almost competing with that in the bylaw. Um, but if you have it nested under when site plan review is not required, then that's the only instance when that that can happen. Um, I didn't feel the competition. I just thought it would be clearer to the applicant. So I think that's the I think that's what the building commissioner felt like. If we had it at the same, you know, hierarchy in terms of um, you know, levels, that it would then be, you know, it'd be competing with it. But 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Janet. Bruce. I just uh, wanted to thank uh, Nate and Chris and others, I guess Maureen probably as well, uh, for all of this. When I was reviewing the packet and uh, trying to understand this in relation to uh, Article 14, I, I, like Janet, I was pretty confused. I didn't quite see which way was up and so forth. But the, con the conversation over the last hour or, or hour and a half has uh, clarified a great deal for me. And I thank you, Nate, for your persistence and so forth. And I think, you know, with the exception of the, uh, um, the, the concern or the, 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 the query that I have about the number, the 250 number, um, basically, it seems to me to be uh, broadly supportive. I mean, personally, speaking personally, I can broadly support all this. Whereas um, 24 hours ago, I didn't have really a great deal of sense about how I was going to handle all of this. So thank you for your uh, 90 minutes of explication. Um, it's been very helpful. All right, thanks, Bruce. So Chris and Nate, have you received the kind of feedback you needed tonight? And should we consider this uh, closed until it comes back from town council? It's up to you. If you want to discuss this more, you know, you're welcome to do that. Um, okay. My guess is that town council is going to take it up on October 3rd and send it back to you. But if you want to, when would your next opportunity be? After tonight, your next opportunity isn't until October 19th. That's mm -hmm. when your next meeting is. So you could discuss it then, but you might have already gotten a referral for a public hearing. Yeah. Okay. Janet. Um, I would like to, I, I, I don't know if there's urgency to getting it to town council, but I think that the issue of the size of the restaurant and the time, the um, when, you know, I, I understand the distinction about like things, you know, you know, a restaurant that closes at 1130 or, or, or a bar with food is quite different from one that stays open. And I'm thinking about, you know, close to where I live, um, you know, Mission Cantina, um, every, you know, surrounded by small houses and apartment buildings and condos, um, you know, Southeast Street intersecting with Route 9, you know, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, there's low income housing, you know, units with kids living right there. And, you know, I just think that the impacts are greater at night and with the bigger establishment. So I'd, I'd like to have a better handle on you know, what's 250, like the list of bigger restaurants, you know, like maybe Ginger Garden might be one of the bigger ones. I don't know, but I just, I don't feel like I have a good handle on. And I do think that the 1130 at night closing time is big. It's going to be big, you know, when, you know, in a, in a town where you have a lot of residential housing right next to small, you know, a large restaurant and stuff. So I, I think, I, I think we should talk about that more, you know, and, and attaching to that outdoor music and outdoor dining till or whatever till late so okay. right I mean, we're saying those a bar or those large establishments are by special permit and so um you know yeah, i think i'm saying like i don't have a handle at what what a 200 capacity restaurant yeah. is so that yeah. seems really big to me so yeah so that that's parallel to what bruce was asking right give us a little bit more context for that threshold yeah. All right, so board members, um, would we like to bring put this on the agenda now for October 19th or a later date? Uh, yeah, or would people like to just see how the process goes with CRC and town council? Chris, I guess I'll call on you. Well, I'm looking at what we have on the slate for October 19th. We have coming back to 51 Spalding Street. We have our, I'm imagining that flood mapping will come back then. We also have the Meadows subdivision. So October 19th might be kind of Easy. overburdened. Maybe you could try November 2nd if you wanted to talk about this again. And, right, then, and we also have 47 Olympia Drive, Arnold. That's Olympia. right. You're going to. October 19th, at least. Yes, October 19th. Thank you. Right. So we. Make sure you've got coffee in the house on October 19th. Um, 
So do you want us to bring this back on October 19th or maybe November 2nd? I guess, I mean, I mean would, would the planning board need to refer or recommend that it go to council for them to pick it up or are they still going to just to look at it? Um, it, it can, I mean, if I remember the flow chart and it can come in from into town council from staff, it doesn't need to come through planning board. Right. right, so we'll have to talk to the building commissioner and then we'll also talk to CRC about whether they feel that this is ready to bring to town council, but I suspect that they will. Um, and then of course, you know, you can open a public hearing and continue the public hearing. You don't have to decide in one night about this. Right. So um, why don't we oh, try do to you bring want, it? Do you wanna go ahead and put it on the agenda on October, whatever, or November, whatever it was? November 2nd, yeah. Um, why don't we just stick it on the agenda and see if we can remember to discuss that at our next meeting and whether it still makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right. So we'll consider that topic closed for this evening. Uh, the time is 8.16. We normally take a break around this time. Uh, I'd like to give you a chance to get up and walk around. So uh, we'll take a five minute break. Um, Try to come back at 8.23 and uh, mute yourself and turn off your camera while you're gone. Well, last time. Have fun. Yeah. Fun. Oh, Leah called.
All right, I see the clock says 923. I went, so, I, went, I went credit for being here. <laughs> Time. Yes, I see Janet back. <laughs> I see Johanna and Bruce and Andrew, Chris and Pam. Mm -hmm. Did you say 923? Oh, did I? I, I, think I, I did. meant 823. <laughs> 823, yeah. No. All right, so we still need Tom and Karen. There's Tom. Yeah. You're sticking with us, Tom. I was hoping to hold on until 923 when you told me. <laughs> well, maybe I should do the intro for this next public hearing that we skipped and see if I can make that go on long enough that Karen is back. Does that make sense, Chris? I see you nodding. Here she is. There she is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the time now is 8.25, 8.25, not 9.25. And we will go back to the second of our public hearings, item four on the agenda. Um, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding zoning bylaw, 
Article 2, Zoning Districts, and Article 3, Use Regulations, and Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District, to see if the town will vote to add Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District to the Zoning Bylaw, and amend Article 2, Zoning Districts, to add FEMA Floodplain Overlay District, and amend related sections of Article 3, Use re Regulations, to regulate activities in 100 year floodplain as shown on the flood insurance rate maps issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA for the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, the flood insurance rate maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. Um, so we also have a zoning bylaw official zoning map for the FEMA floodplain overlay district to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district for the purpose of regulating activities as described in article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district. And this uh, public hearing has been continued from June 1st and September 7th of this year. Um, I will offer if any board members have disclosures, now is the time to, to bring them up. I don't remember any disclosures from the previous uh, episode of this hearing. So Chris, do you wanna start us off? Sure. Um, so the latest news on this is that um, you, you held your public hearing on the 1st of June and the 7th of September. And at that time, you know, determined that the um, flood maps hadn't actually been sent to us yet. Um, our letter of final determination was sent out on August 9th, and we were expecting to get our maps a month later, which should have been on September 9th. Um, but today I was in touch with our uh, consultant AECOM, and they said um, that they were surprised that the maps hadn't been issued yet. So they got in touch with uh, FEMA, and FEMA said they're still um, doing a technical review. Um, they did send me the maps in their current data form, but um, they're not really maps that are ready to be adopted by the planning board yet because they're not in the final format and they don't have the dates on them so i would again encourage you to continue this public hearing and i'm so sorry to say that um probably to november 2nd because i hope by november 2nd that we will have the maps the the gentleman at aecom told me today that we should probably have our maps um, hard copies of them, in fact, in in a month. So um, hopefully right. we we'll get them. So we need a, I guess we need a motion to continue this public hearing to November 2nd. And Chris, do you have a time that you would recommend be part of the motion? Why don't we do it first thing in the meeting? Because um, the other thing that you're going to possibly discuss that night article 14 doesn't have a particular time associated mm -hmm. with it since it wasn't a public hearing mm -hmm. and you would need to um continue both public hearings and to that time whatever that time is so so this is the the bylaw hearing on articles 2 3 and 16 and mm -hmm. the bylaw hearing on the fema floodplain Overlay district. The official zoning map. The yeah. official, the official zoning map. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I see all kinds of hands. People want to make the motion. Janet, you got there first. I so move, but I also have a question afterwards. Okay. Well, we'll come back to you. Andrew, you were second. And I will happily second. Thanks. All do right, we want to you. say a particular time? Do we want to say 635? 635, yes. right? Okay, that's good. Yeah. All right, Janet, you had a question? So I, I just had a quick question about the um, draft. Was the, the changes that are in blue, 
which is a new color for me. Um, those are all the changes we talked about from our last um, time we talked last last meeting. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, Andrew, you have your hand up. Is that a legacy? Okay. Yes, it is. All right. So I don't see any more hands. Uh, unless there's more discussion at this time, we can go ahead and have a vote. All right, well, we'll go through it. Starting at the end of the alphabet, Karen. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Tom? Right. You're sounding worse and worse, Tom. <laughs> Bruce? I as well. Thank you. And I'm an I as well. So seven votes in favor of continuing the hearing for articles two, three, and 16, and for the uh, FEMA floodplain official zoning map to November 2nd at 635. Okay, that's the end of item four in our agenda. We've already done item five. The time is 8.32 and we'll go on to old business. Do we have any unanticipated old business, Chris? No old business, nope. All right, how about unanticipated new business? Maybe we could use this opportunity to talk about the packets. Okay. If Pam is up for that. Um, we have been experimenting with a new format of um, sending you the packets, and that format is in keeping with the way the um, town council sends out its packets and in keeping with the mm -hmm. way the uh, committees of town council send out their packets and others do as well, including the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, and this seems to be an accepted way of, of doing this. Um, we are currently providing paper packets to, um, let's see, two members of our, our no, three members of three. our uh, board. And um, if people would like us to provide a paper packet to them, uh, such as Bruce, Bruce had trouble downloading some of the documents, we would be um, able to provide him with a paper packet if that would make his journey easier. I hate paper. Okay. Um, we're reluctant to take on the third option, which is to scan this scan packets because scanning of the packets gets very complicated, especially when we have um, large drawings and different size papers. Mm -hmm. And Pam, you know, tries very hard to make it all in one scan, but sometimes that's not possible. So we don't want to be in a position of having to make the paper packets and do the format that we're currently uh, trying out and do the scan. So, so that's um, our, our report on the matter. And um, <laughs> maybe <laughs> planning board members would like to discuss this. Okay, yeah, I see a couple of hands, Tom. Sure, thanks, Doug. And, and thanks guys for trying something new. I, I actually found it really helpful to, um, be able to find the actual documents that we're referring to, as opposed to having to scan through 86 or 98 or however many pages it is to find the section that we're looking at. So um, the idea of breaking it up um, the way you had on the website so we can access each project or problem or um, agenda as needed was super helpful to me and I, I had no problems with it. I found it actually way more efficient than scanning through so many pages um, all wrapped up in one PDF. So I, I appreciated the change and it, it works for me. Good. Andrew. Yeah, I, I generally agree with everything Tom said. Um, I would, I guess one thing I'm, I would ask for is, um, would it be possible if folks agree for the, uh, the directories to be, um, to correspond to the, to the meeting item and the meeting agenda item number, right? So instead of 47 Olympia, Olympia Drive, you could have, you know, uh, 
whatever that was today. Item, item, item three. three. Yeah, because like that, so that should would take it one step further. So I I could drill down easily and find those, and then also just and I think you've done a great job already, but um, very descriptive names, you know, like no uh, no uh, abbreviations or things like that. So it's clear uh, what what document we're looking at. But I. Uh, I love the approach and I think it will definitely be an improvement. It, it already has been for me. Good. Bruce. I agree with Tom and Andrew. Uh, uh, I, I would like to be able to get the, uh, I, I need to know how to get the, uh, the agenda uh, and the uh, minutes. Um, but I do agree that uh, having uh, the discrete packaging so that you can go and uh, download or access uh, uh, clearly and, uh, and so forth is a better system. Um, so uh, Pam, I, I guess I need to just uh, correspond with you to find out, um, mm -hmm. or is there any reason why the agenda and the uh, minutes aren't in the, uh, in the same uh, packet, uh, in, in the same downloading uh, um, they, they absolutely, they are in there, um, but because they did not correspond with one of the topics, they are like single documents. Nate, can you pull that up? I would love to see that. Because, yeah, I was going to yeah. say, it's, it's actually in the, in the main folder for the root folder, yeah. And so yep. it shows up there and it's, yeah. It's so just you, of, and so they should be there. in here. Yeah, is that, if that's on. visible. Whoa, 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 hold on. It is. Uh, so if this, maybe I can make my screen a little bigger. If we, when you get the link to the packets, it'll bring you here to meeting packets. Yep. So if this is all collapsed. Right. If you click on 2022 and then the date of the meeting. Yep. If you did click that. on just that parent folder, double click it. Oh. The, the, the drop downs will occur, but then over here, you'll see what mm -hmm. documents are actually just in that main folder. And so typically in that main folder, we'd have minutes and agendas, you know, maybe if there's announcements or something like a, you know, a letter or memo from PVPC. And then the specific agenda items would be, um, have folders. So, you know, if there's ANRs, there might be an ANR folder, you know, um, and then, then, you know, each, the documents associated with each uh, topic are then over here. But on the main folder, okay. the date is where we'd have kind of the, I think I'm like as nebulous documents, right? They're just no. If if you know to if you know to click it, then it's there. I right. didn't know yes. to click it. But I, I think I think that I think I've seen other. Um, I'm not sure if it's CRC, but they in when you click the date, they list the agenda and the draft minutes separately, and you don't have to double click it. So we're also trying to make our stuff accessible to members of the public. So the the double click seems like a secret. And yeah. it's, oh, wait, it's not good. a double click. I mean, if you, I mean, I said double clicked, it opens the folder, but if you just single click it, it's the same thing. It just, you know, it shows up over here. You just have to have your cursor and highlight each folder to see what's over on the right. So, you know, anytime you just hit a folder, whatever's in it populates over here. So. Oh, I have a question, which is um, for those of you that didn't get paper like Janet and I did, um, are you just looking at the documents from this website during the meeting or are you downloading PDFs? So yeah, so I, if you yeah, so if you click on this, sorry, it does this, it'll open a new tab and then yeah. it'll you know open in your browser. Um, okay. And then you have the option to download as a PDF. So when I was sharing my screen earlier, you know, I was I essentially downloaded every document individually as a PDF. So it's on my, you know, it's on my hard drive, but um, typically I would just use it, the online version if I wasn't presenting. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm finding that uh, during Zoom meetings, I try not to have too many other things open because my bandwidth doesn't seem to allow it and I start to have trouble. So um, I may be an outlier in a, in a remote part of town from a network perspective, but uh, um, I, Chris and Pam, if you're willing to keep printing packets for me, I'd be, I would appreciate that. But if we're not gonna do that anymore, I'll figure out how to work with this. I think we can continue to print packets for the people who we already do that for, yep. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I was only part finished here. Um, the, 
I download them for somewhat of the reason that Doug said. I have multiple screens and then I open them up and I have them all queued so I can swipe across and I can see all these things quickly and I don't have to rely on what's showing on the screen. For example, if, if, uh, if Article 12 is, uh, um, is open uh, on the screen and, and they've zoomed in on a certain portion of it, but I want to look at some other part of it, I have it on another screen somewhere. So uh, I like that and, and so I will download them, which brings me to the, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's quite time consuming to download everything. You can only do it one at a time. And once you've downloaded it, then you've got to go all the way back and click the, uh, basically I have to click the link that uh, Pam gave me to the town website. And then I uh, click the package. So there's about five clicks um, to get back to the download and then you click that and then you click save. So basically you've got to click seven times for every document you want to download and it scrolls back in a way that you have to also scroll down because the, uh, the thing defaults. So it's, 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 it's a little annoying and I don't know whether anything can be done to make it uh, easier. So you can download multiple uh, documents at once um, but if you can't, I guess I'll get used to it, but I'll just have to allow 20 minutes, but that's less time than it would take me to drive up, uh, to, uh, town to get it off the door of the town hall or whatever Janet does. So, uh, now I know, uh, I stand by what I said earlier and what Tom and Andrew said, I like this system in principle, it's working well. Now I know how to get the minutes. I'm even happier and I'll figure out how to expedite the downloading part of it. So thank you. All right, thank you, Bruce. Andrew? Yeah, I was gonna say if folks use Chrome, like you don't need to download it. I just open in a new tab and I just have one uh, one Chrome window set up for it. And Doug, maybe you should just stop mining Bitcoin during the call to grab and product <laughs> band with just a PDF file for goodness sakes, right? <laughs> well, I think we just need to upgrade our computer actually. Tom. I think, I think planning board should fund that for you. <laughs> I mean, you think UMass would give you a better computer? No, I was going to say, I, I, I typically just, you know, this week, just ran them all as tabs and um, the descriptors are quite well, uh, quite specific. So if I mouse over them, I can go through the tabs. So I have all the different things open and it's super efficient. I, I found it to be super helpful. So um, you know, I look forward to... Uh, this next time. So I remember being like, what page are we on? 89? Like, who's 89 is that? And mm -hmm. yeah, it was a different mm -hmm. animal. And I think this is much more efficient. So, okay. Janet. So I think it's great that people can click on the document and it's separate because I, you know, I've scrolled through that. So I've had people say that it's like, you know, they're like, where's the document and contacting me. And I'm like, oh, it's on page 69 out of this giant 140 page packet. And so I think this new system is great. I would just suggest that when you click on the, the packet, it says agenda and it says draft minutes and it's all in a line with the other documents, the other, the other items on the, you know, cause I think people aren't gonna, they may miss the way Bruce missed that. Cause I actually went and looked from that. I didn't notice that either. So I would notice, you know, agenda draft minutes, you know, whatever, you know, hearing on blank, blank, blank. I would, I would expect to see that in the line. So I think that might be the little twist that will help people. Yeah, no, yeah, I, understand, I understand what you're saying now, Janet. It's interesting. Um, you know, there's a, you know, our, the, the content manager of our website has some strict formatting. And so yeah. the module we're using for this may not allow that where in other parts of the um, website, it will, it'll show underneath that folder. And so I, I when you said that, it, it, right, it made sense to me that it would, you would just see it and not have it be off on the right. And so, um, yeah, I, I think Pam and I can talk with um, IT if that's possible. Because when you when you just said it, it made sense to me, and so I think. Can I, can I make a recommendation, Nate and okay. everyone? If underneath the 20, 2022 9 date, there was a folder under that that was packet contents or 
you know, general info and that had the agenda and past minutes and other things. So it was actually a folder underneath that that might clarify it for people rather than it being in the in the primary folder. So yeah. if there was some descriptor that you could use in that subfolder, that would probably work with your IT, but it probably also work with the public to kind of give them an incentive to figure out that that's where the agenda is. Otherwise. Or just call that folder agenda and draft minutes. I also just have to say, I love my paper packet because I can take it wherever I can. I go if I'm camping, you know, the whole thing is very easy, so. It's, it's all in your phone, Janet. It goes with you wherever you go. Okay, so uh, it's nice to have a diver diverse board with multi-generational skills. So, uh, Chris, did you, you've got your hand up. I just wanted to thank Pam, especially for going to the effort of putting this new format together, because I think it was a big, um, it, it was a big job. And thank you, Pam, and thanks, Nate, for um, supporting Pam in doing this. Thank you. All right. Thanks, yes. Nate. Thank you, Pam. All right, Chris and Pam, have you got what you needed on that topic for this evening? Mm -hmm. All right. Sure. Um, any other new business you wanted to bring up? Okay. All right, the time is 847 and we'll go on to the form A, A and R subdivision applications. Do we have any? No. All right. Um, the item 10, the upcoming SVP, SPR, SUB applications, any? No, not tonight. All right. Number 11, planning board committee and liaison reports. You skip number 10. No, well, I skipped number nine, the upcoming ZBA applications. Oh, oh. so no. <laughs> okay, no. thank you. Now number 11, we can start yeah. with Bruce, uh, PVPC. No, I, I plan to call Jack uh, and get to know him. Okay. I haven't done that yet. Are you receiving invitations to the PVPC board meetings or whatever it is? That you're I assume I will, but I don't. I haven't okay. received any yet. I, I imagine they'll come as an email, and I don't. Well, I probably I should check junk mail and things like that. Actually, I haven't done that, but uh, but mm -hmm. no, I haven't received anything. Okay, Andrew, anything on CPAC? We don't have a meeting again until October, um, but um, I'm responsible for the minutes for the last meeting. I haven't written them yet, so if anybody is, is you know, still wants to get back into the, the groove of writing minutes, they can help me with that. Um, <laughs> I expect I'll have no takers. Uh, I know we did have um, Matt King. We, we did have some announcements for uh, who's been appointed. So we've got a new representative from the Recreation Commission, which is Matt Cain. Uh, and then a new representative from the Conservation Commission, which is Michelle Lau. Lab, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, but um, the the committee has been filled out with appointments. So. Okay. Tom, DRB. Uh, we have a meeting next Wednesday, so I will have a report after that. Okay. And Janet, Solar Bylaw. We're we're meeting this week, so there's no. To meet on Friday, so okay, no update. And Chris, anything for the CRC? The CRC met on the 8th of September and talked about um, the flood maps, and they're meeting again on the 29th of September to talk about, I think, rental registration and what we've been calling Article 14, and I think that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, report of chair. I'm not, I don't have anything to report this evening. Um, Chris, anything? Report of staff? I don't have anything to report. No. Okay. All right. The time is 8.50. Eight, that's 8.50, not 9.50. And we are ready to adjourn. Yay! Uh, are you sure we don't have anything else we can talk about? 
no. <laughs> like another hour, maybe just something. Um, so, so we have al almost a month till our next meeting. Seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, October 19th, right? That's right. We're not having a meeting on October 5th because of the Jewish holy days. Well, I, I personally appreciate that uh, this gap in the schedule because I'm taking a two week vacation mm -hmm. and, and I don't have to miss any meetings. And Tom, <laughs> Tom, you don't have to run the meeting while I'm gone. No. So thank God. Have a good evening and I'll see you <laughs> in a month. Have a Bye nice all. vacation. Bye. Bye. Enjoy Bye. vacation, everyone. Thank you. Tom, don't succumb. Stop recording. Are you sure you want to stop recording?